make sure we keep on task. Um, approve minutes of Monday, September 27th. The full board. Have a motion? Kathy, would you entertain a motion for all three of the the uh, minutes for approval? Yes. So I would make a motion to approve the minutes of Monday, September 26, Monday, August 23rd, Thursday, September 16th, all of 2021. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Is there any discussion on those on the motion? All right, hearing none, so moved. Um, board correspondence. Um, I received correspondence and I forwarded it to everybody from Peter Kling. Um, so if you have an opportunity to take a look at that and read it over, it's um, some suggestions to the anti-racism policy. Um, and I forwarded it on and shared it. He has some thoughts that he wanted us all to think about. Any other board correspondence? Okay. No? Okay. Um, all right, so we're on to board development series, board operations, open meeting law. Susan, with us again tonight. Hi, Susan. Hello, and thank you. I have to tell you, I looked at the agenda and I thought there's no way they're ready for me at six o'clock. So you guys are <laughs> on it and I'm glad I was on time. Um, nice to see you all again, although for most of you, I'm seeing your initials, but that's lovely too. Uh, I... I'm here tonight to talk about open meeting law. I think I can present, right? Do I have a share screen? Hmm. You do now. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, let's try that again. I'm sorry. Okay. You just hover over the three little dots. Yeah, I know it's saying it's available, but it's just wanting to share the Zoom. I'm sorry. Just one moment. Yeah. So what format is your presentation? In? It's a PowerPoint. I guess I can just upload it into a Google Sheets. Maybe that's the better way to go. We didn't have this problem last month, did we? No, I had it ahead of time. Susan, do you want to share Ray? I'm sorry? Get it right next time. Do you want to share your presentation with Ray and then he can project it for you? That's what we did last month. You're right. It is what we did last time. And I will attempt to do that, assuming it is not too big. So, Ray, your email again? R. Yep. B A L L O U. I got it. Thanks. Good. I am sorry, everybody. I did not expect this little glitch. Okay. It just told me it sent, so hopefully you'll have it there in a moment. And in the meantime, I'll just say to you about um, open meeting law, I am not an attorney. And so what I've got prepared for you tonight is sort of the top line. I'm not going to say superficial, but sort of the top line stuff because our time is also limited. There is a, a pre-recorded webinar, well, past webinar now recorded on our website in full that we gave in May of 2020. So there were some news in there accommodating the uh, 
state of emergency changes that were made, but it was done in conjunction with the Secretary of State's office and the Deputy Secretary of State was on that webinar on that call with us. So if you're looking for more than we're gonna be able to cover tonight, I'm gonna to suggest that you go there. Have you had open meeting law training before as a board? No, okay. So I'll, I'll start by saying that the intent of the open meeting law is transparency. Um, the Secretary of State and legislature have, and, and many states are now having some version of an open meeting law. Uh, we are publicly elected officials handling public money, and therefore the public is, should be um, able to understand as much as they want to about how that money is being managed and the work that you all are doing in your boards. And that is the essence of the open meeting law. Where it gets tricky sometimes is it's inconvenient, uh, particularly for smaller groups that are trying to get together quickly on the fly and then you realize you need to warn your meeting and put out the agenda five days in advance and all these other um, specifics. Thank you very much, Ray. Um, so uh, it, managing it is harder than the intent of the law. We can jump ahead here. So we'll talk about the open meeting law. Embedded within that is executive session. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what you can and cannot do electronically as a board and as a board member, which also takes into account email and social media. Um, because as we talked a little bit about last time, you really can't take off that board hat. You can put another hat over it sometimes, but the board hat is always there. And that applies with open meeting law. Thank you. Um, so the open meeting law declaration of public policy, this is just the statutory reference. And I think what's interesting here, and it wouldn't have been interesting to me until I started like spending a lot of time around our education laws, is this is one VSA. The education stuff is all 16 VSA. This comes first and before so many other laws because it applies so broadly to any public commission, board, council, or public agency. Um, and I think when we put it in that perspective, we're in some pretty esteemed company as to who is um, required to meet the demands of the public meeting law. So I mentioned open to the public is kind of the baseline for open meeting law. That means that they have access to anything that you're discussing, your conversations and the documentation that supports them. Uh, advanced public notice, public participation in governmental decisions are all built into the way Vermont's open meeting law is structured. So the law says it's public bodies. That means anyone, basically anyone who is publicly elected and having anything having to do with public monies. Um, that means that board committees and even subcommittees are also subject to open meeting laws. So if you're having a, a policy committee meeting, it needs to be warned the same way as a board meeting with the agenda put out five days in advance and available to anybody who wants a copy. Committees often get forgotten here. I guess is the way I'd say that. So when does it apply? Um, critical in all of this are the term quorum, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. It's a, a majority of the entire public body. And again, that entire public body could be the committee. Even though the committee wasn't elected as a committee, it is a byproduct of the board, thus still a public body. Um, and I know this sounds nuts because it sounds nuts to me because I'm not an attorney, 
But the open meeting law, particularly as it was amended in 2018 by legislature and the Secretary of State, uh, spends quite a bit of paper and ink defining what is a meeting and conversely, what is not a meeting. And actually they start with what is not a meeting, which is kind of something you don't see very often in, in uh, official documentation. So the stress point here and the italics and the bold are mine. When the quorum of the public body gathers for the purpose of discussing business or taking action, it's a meeting. If you all happen to attend the same church and you're sitting next to each other some Sunday, that's not a public meeting, unless you got talking about board business. You wanna go out to coffee, you can do that. Um, and uh, so they even go on then to define what is business of the public body and it's governmental functions. So your meetings, meetings of your subcommittees, um, public forums that you might hold with a majority of your board, with the quorum of your board present, all would be considered subject to open meeting law. Got a question? Yes, good. Susan, hi. Um, uh, I need clarification. You're saying subcommittees and committees also fall under this. But the definition of a meeting is having a quorum present. Right. So if, if we it's have a, a six-member board, if we have a six-member board, a quorum would be four. So my question is, does the open meeting law apply when you have less than a quorum? Yes, because so it becomes then the public body is the committee. Okay. And the quorum, if you have three people, the quorum is two. Okay, so it's a quorum of the convening body. It's Correct. not the quorum of the overall board. Exactly. Gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Susan, I have a question. Sure. Could you go back to the last slide, Ray? Um, so if the board wanted to get, to get together or needed to get together to d discuss something that's not included in the business of the public board. For example, inter um, issues uh, issues that were getting in way of the board doing their work. So interpersonal issues. Would that have to be a public meeting? That is one that I will. So there will we'll get into some definitions of what is and is not a meeting. Um, and that's a what I would call a kind of gray area. Um, so there are times when it is okay for the board to meet, as you say, with the intent of not discussing any meet any board business. And I would I would really direct that question to your attorney, who's probably more familiar with your specific issues. If if you're going to spend a whole two hours just um, getting to the core of difference interpersonal issues and interpersonal differences i think that technically that does not need to be a warned public meeting that can be um a, a, a gathering of the board yeah or? yeah but but the caveat is when you are seated or standing or walking or with the people that with whom you generally conduct board work, there is a temptation to slide into it. And that's why it's, you know, a, a, as a matter of course, it's a safer thing to run it as an open meeting. But I understand there are circumstances um, that probably are not covered in the umbrella of this law. Thank you. Sure. So I took this and I flipped it back around backwards. I started with what is a meeting? Um, a meeting can occur anywhere. So you could all be seated in one place. 
You could also all be not seated in one place. And that one place could be um, a restaurant. If you're all together and you're going to talk about board business, it doesn't have to be in the boardroom, wherever you typically hold your meetings. Um, and it can occur over a string of time. And that kind of blows our conventional definition of meeting out of the water, right? So a string of emails on a topic that is board business is a violation, excuse me, a violation of open meeting law because it's involving a quorum, though you're not all in one place at the same time, um, you are communicating with one another about board business. And group emails, even more problematic. So there are provisions in the open meeting law that you can communicate by email for a few select topics, scheduling a meeting, creating or um, refining your agenda, and distribution of materials that will be discussed at the meeting. So if you get a board packet from the chair, and generally those don't come from the chair, generally they come from central office, but if you get a board packet, that's okay as long as you don't then begin a conversation about it in any way, shape, or form until you're all at the warned meeting at the same time. Ethan, I see you have a hand up. Yeah, I guess the way I've always heard it was that you could share information, but you couldn't re reply. Well, there's a limit to how much information you can share also. Um, okay. Because... If you're sharing information that would normally be conveyed from one to all at a meeting, then it should be at the meeting. So it's, it's only these select items. If, if you're sharing information about um, you know, some bids that you were getting, which I don't know why a board member would be, that's really something that needs to be happening in the body proper in the meeting. Okay. So it's 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 fuzzy. Yeah, it's a little it's a little fuzzy. Interpretive. Yep. Um, but no discussion. Zero, none. So the risk is if you share some information, somebody's gonna respond back. Right? And that then might get somebody else involved to respond to both of you. You know, it gets, it gets murky then. Um, so best to just really keep it clean. The, the line is agendas and meeting information to be discussed at a later date. Uh, one thing I will offer as a very useful little tip, which I didn't know until I started working at VSBA, if you send out, if you're board chair and you're sending out the draft agenda to all of your board members and you're encouraging feedback and input or this is, a, you know, or an okay, um, if you send it out as we often do to, and you put each of their addresses in the to line of the email, if somebody hits reply all, you're at risk of a meeting, right? Um, not for that specific item of the agenda, but it might lead to something else, might lead to something else. However, if you put all of those board member names in the BCC line, the blind carbon copy line, and they reply all, it won't go to anybody who's in that blind copy line. So it's really good practice to just use that function and then nobody can accidentally reply all and chime in on something that they didn't mean to. So if then it's a communication strictly between you and the chair, you're not a quorum. I don't, you don't have any three people boards, do you? We do have You one. do, okay. So then you need, that group needs to be especially careful um, because then two of you are a quorum. I see a couple of, uh, Andrew has a hand up. 
Um, yeah, so one thing that we do do communication about is um, like the presentations that we give about the budget, um, you know, the informational meetings that we do for the budget season. Um, is that the sort of thing where you just need to have fewer than a quorum working on it at any one time? Or like if we email out that presentation and ask for comments, as long as it's done individually, it's okay? Or is that the sort of thing that should be done in a meeting? Um, it's best to be done in a meeting, but I understand that sometimes you've had the last meeting and it needs to be spit and polish ready for the presentation. Um, so in those circumstances, I believe it would be okay for one person to send it out to all and have them respond individually to you, if you're the one who sent it out, without including the rest of the board. So if you want to say, you know, I think this slide might be clearer, easier to understand if it said, hmm, instead of the way you've got it laid out, one-on-one, -on -one, that's okay. Ideally, it happens face-to-face -face in a meeting, but if I, I believe that would be okay. One -on -one. So does that mean that, you know, like Google Docs has the comment on it yeah so, yeah okay google docs no you I, I, that kind of collaborative working off uh, you know out of the meeting is problematic i know it's so easy right it seems like it should be su such a wonderful tool but it's a problem for open meeting law because you're actually advancing the work of the board behind closed doors stacy so you can stop me if I'm jumping the gun, if you're going to get to this later. But what happens if you do accidentally uh, break this rule, if you reply all and hit your board or if you add something to a shared doc? And um... So if you are, um, let me back up. As a public body, it is your, and members of a pub public body, it is your obligation to know this law and comply with it. The, if you mess up one time and it's contained, probably nothing happens realistically. There are consequences built into the law for violations, um, but something like that, if it happens on a really occasional because I messed up basis, probably isn't going to come to light. But there are uh, histories, recent histories in the state of, of the local reporter who's covering the board meeting, not being able to get the information that he, they think they deserve and they'll cite an open meeting law violation. And then it's a big McGill, it's a big to do and you have to involve your attorneys, it gets expensive uh, and the penalty to the state is expensive. So, you know, try not to. <laughs> So I mentioned that in 2018, they revised the law and, and defined what is not a meeting. So if, you, if there really is truly no discussion of public business and you're at social gatherings, or even if you come to the VSBA conference in a couple of weeks and you all come, that's not a meeting for you. Um, training programs, and this gets, Sarah, to your question earlier. I've gone in and done um, facilitations with boards that are just not working well, and some of them warn it and some of them don't. And so I, that's why I say I, I encourage you to check with your, your own attorney on that because, uh, you know, one of the ones that warned something like that was because they had been through a violation. And so the board was overly cautious not to run that risk. Um, training programs is, uh, again, it's a fuzzy area, right? Is this a training program that we're doing right now? I think so, right? But one of you might give me an example when you're asking a question of something that actually happened in your meetings, and then all of a sudden you're discussing public business. 
so it's a tough one. Um, so, and just to reiterate, other than those three items, scheduling a meeting, organizing and refining an agenda and distributing meeting materials, email, telephone, teleconferencing or in-person meetings for anything else is risky. It's not automatically a violation, but it's risky. Public, so there are really specific criteria associated with every phase of the meeting. And I'm, this is where I'm gonna gloss over some of them because some of them are pretty nitty gritty. And I'm going, you know, I, I'll refer you to that webinar if, if you want to dive deeper. It was put on by two attorneys and it's very technical in that sense. But regular meetings, you're obligated to set the, a regular time and place for your meetings and post and make agendas available within 40, at least 48 hours in advance of the meeting. Special meetings have slightly different parameters, so it's 24 hours notice, um, and you need to make sure. So in the regular meetings, you have at your organizational meeting identified what your regular media channels are, your media outlets, and one of them is probably your website. Special meetings have more specificity about the warning because it's a shorter period of time. So your newspapers, radio stations, anybody who specifically asks about it, it in writing should get notified. Um, and obviously all members of the board, 24 hour advance notice for those agendas. And occasionally there is such a thing as an emergency meeting and it's called on the fly, really emergency. Um, and the legal definition is when necessary to respond to unforeseen occurrences or condition requiring immediate attention. Last March comes to mind, right? That would be an emergency meeting. Um, or if the roof gives way in one of your buildings, that would be an emergency meeting. I can't wait 48 hours for you to get your agenda posted, right? Um, and so, you're gonna get it out there the best way you can to let people know that you're meeting. It's still an open meeting. It's just that the, the criteria for warning it and the advance public notice softens a little bit. So posting agendas, I mentioned before, at least 48 hours before a regular meeting, 24 hours for a special meeting. Where on a website, if, if you have one, in the municipal clerk's office for all of the towns in your district, if you cross town lines, um, in two designated public places. And that's usually established at your organizational meeting and or there's a lot of history behind that and somebody... Uh, probably the assistant at central office knows where those places are. It's often a town hall or a public library or some public facility where people know to look at that bulletin board. Um, and also made, so if somebody were to come to central office asking for the agenda, it would be given to them directly or contacted central office directly. Minutes. Minutes are fun because there are actually legal um, standards for minutes in open meeting law. So there's a minimum content that needs to be included. They need to be posted in draft form within five days of the meeting. Um, and they have to stay posted for at least a year after the meeting. The only exception is so the draft minutes are posted and then you have your meeting and you approve them. So then those draft minutes can be replaced with the approved minutes. Um, but they need to be available for a year's time thereafter. Ron, thank you. Okay, executive session. This is an area a lot of boards really um, take 
lightly. And it's really very, very specific in the law. There is a limited scope that to what is permissible for executive session. And there are actually 14 statutory categories and they're all quite specific. Um, the intent needs to be really clear that you're going into executive session for one of those 14 reasons. And so the motion to go to executive session should include the, we recommend that you just include the, the language directly from those 14 uh, reasons. So put it all right in your motion you know, that we're going into executive session. If, if you're going into executive session for personnel, which is commonly reflected in minutes, that's wrong. Personnel is not automatically a case for, special, for uh, executive session. If it's a student discipline issue or something with a student, then it's executive session because you're maintaining the student's privacy. Uh, if it's an issue of uh, an employee of the district having some question of, in their performance, that is not by and large a protected category. Ethan. Yeah, um, uh, where do we get a copy of these 14? I, I will I send I them to you. Them. Um, they're available. Actually, the probably the best resource is the Secretary of State's office. Oh, oh thank you, Megan. Megan. <laughs> Got you. Thank you. I, I've never, I've never heard this was available before. My, my bad, but uh, no, that's <laughs> why I'm here. I'm glad yep. you asked the question, and thank you, Megan, for short circuiting my response. Um, yeah, and they're very clearly laid out. Um, and finally, confirm that it's an appropriate action. And if there's any question, you'll know ahead of time if you're going to have executive session that night or that week. So check with the with your attorney about the appropriateness of it. If you're having some difficulty navigating the language of those 14 and how this fits in, because it's not all black and white, much as I like to make it look that way in my slides. So the most common one that people, board, school boards rely on is the language I have here to the left. Premature general public knowledge would clearly place the public body or person involved at a substantial disadvantage. So contracts, labor negotiations, arbitration or mediation, grievances, union grievances, um, Civil litigation or prosecution, you know, you don't want to be airing your dirty laundry necessarily if the, if the board is named in a lawsuit, for example, um, and anything that's attorney-client privilege, you know, those, those are obviously confidential. And then it, it goes on, okay? So real estate, if you're negotiating real estate and you're trying to figure out, well, the most we're gonna pay is, <laughs> obviously you're not gonna do that in public session because the seller of the real estate is gonna know that's your maximum and you're not gonna be able to have a meaningful negotiation about that. Employee actions, appointments, evaluation, discipline, and dismissal. Um, Student actions, as I mentioned, there are privacy issues there. Public records, um, public safety, if there's a clear and imminent danger to public safety, and security or emergency response measures, if disclosure could jeopardize public safety. So this is really an opportunity for the board to safely have discussions that otherwise could alter the outcomes. It's not to protect you from having hard conversations in public. Yeah, Megan. Thanks. Uh, so the, this slide seems useful. And would you suggest instead of using the term uh, personnel, like the motion would be, I'd like to make a motion for employee action or, or any of these? 
but I'd go back to the premature knowledge would uh, that's in the previous slide. That's the language that's really critical. Okay, so not all dealings on real estate are necessarily protected. But if you are negotiating a contract that has price implications, then the other party, because it's open to the public, you know, the seller of the property has access to your, your internal discussions that really weakens your negotiation, right? Similarly, you're not gonna, <laughs> you're not going to in public meetings say, well, we're gonna put three and a half percent in the con in the budget for the contract that we're negotiating, even though right now we're at five percent, but we think we'll get to three and a half and it'll be okay. You don't want them to know that now when they're at, you know, whatever, they're at seven and you're at five. You know, if if the union had advanced knowledge of that, then your whole um your whole negotiation would be immaterial because they'd know what your bottom line is. They'd know how far you'd go. Just to finish the question, well, or re-ask it, like if I'm just, can you give us a sample language of how that would sound if it was a student matter? So we can make sure we say everything that needs to be said. Like I, it, it we, we have made a finding that Premature knowledge of a student matter would put us at a disadvantage. So, I well, would in the case of a student matter, it's different language, mm -hmm. and that's where I'd refer you to back to the link that you just so yeah. kindly put up there, right? And and I would use that language. Just take it right out of the statute. That's your safest bet, um, and it should be really clear what that means. Okay, does that help? Okay, um, so. Executive session, the motion should include a loose reference to the subject matter. You know, we're going into executive session to discuss negotiations on um, the school purchase of the lot of land that's next door. I don't, you know, or more often the case now, negotiations about selling off a school that we're not using anymore. OK, that happens from time to time. So that should be specified in your motion. So there's no big question what you're going in there to talk about for those who are following the open portion of your meeting. Um, but and, and then the board is expected to be there and you're welcome to invite anybody else to attend. So it may be legal counsel, it's often administration um, who has more knowledge about something that's going on in the schools. Um, and you're welcome to invite anybody, you know, if you're talking about a student's issues, at, it's up to the discretion of the board whether that student ought to be invited. And if so, with or without parents and you know, all of that is up to the board's discretion. This is a good one. Minutes are not required in executive session. And we recommend that you do not take them because if you take them, they, somebody's gonna look for them in a public records request. If they don't exist, you can't, you can't turn them over. And since you cannot take action in an executive session, you must come out of executive session make, and make a motion to take any action in open session. Now you could make action, your action could be, I make a motion that we um, handle the employee issue as was discussed in executive session, because everybody at the board table has just been in that executive session meeting. So you don't have to go into a lot of detail in that motion. And, you know, I put this note at the very bottom here, even if you fit into those 14 categories, if you don't feel that it really is necessary to have executive session for a given topic, don't. It, it, you know, it's a whole lot easier to 
not have to ask for forgiveness if there's no reason to put yourself in that position in the first place. So use it judiciously. It's there. It is a tool. It's a valuable tool. I certainly wouldn't want anybody to feel that it's not accessible. Um, and I think I have this somewhere else, but while I'm looking at this slide, I want to really remind you, everything that happens in executive session, everything is strictly confidential. That's an unwritten rule. And it speaks to board trust, trusting each other, and the community trusting you. Even though they may be dying with curiosity to know how X, Y, or Z went, don't tell them. There's a reason that you left the public meeting to have that discussion. I think I've got two more slides. Yeah, oh, electronics. So we talked about this a little bit already. I, I won't beat it up. But if members are participating remotely, like you all are tonight, um, you need to identify yourselves when the meeting convenes, which you're doing by having your names up. And you need to be able to hear and be heard throughout the meeting. So if you have a bad internet connection and you can't hear what's going on, then you're not, you, sh you're, you shouldn't be marked as being at the meeting because you may have something to say that you can't communicate. And if a quorum is participating remotely, as is the case here, um, the, ag the agenda still must identify a public place and somebody has to be there from the body. So I believe Kathy is at the school somehow. Somebody's there tonight, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. And that member, uh, and to be honest with you, I've seen it both ways that it needs to be a board member or a representative of the body. So if you delegate that to, uh, you know, to Chris, that's, I think that's permissible, but safeguard is have at least one board member present. And if you're meeting remotely, then if there is a vote that's not unanimous, you must do a roll call to make sure that every vote is, is registered. Email, we talked about some. Um, you know, it, it gets dicey when you start having any kind of discussion. Um, so probably not okay. A group email involving a quorum that discusses anything about your business, your board business, collective editing of a document, um, participation in a Facebook group. So let's say half plus one of you are members of some parent Facebook group around your school and somebody from you know the public chimes in about what a crappy thing that happened at school on thursday and can you believe this teacher said this and that teacher said that don't get involved because even though that might be your best friend who would you'd be talking to as a person to person once you're in a bigger setting like a social media um, platform, you've crossed that line and it's you've now made a public statement. And you're one board member who doesn't speak for the board in that context. Yeah, Sarah. Um, in Stratford, uh, a lot of the communications with throughout the town come from a listserv. Mm -hmm. And um, would that be the same thing if, if is there any time when there's something about a school issue that I can come in as a private citizen? No, yeah. not in that context. It's it. I gave you a very quick answer. I want to underscore, I'm not an attorney, but you are perceived as a board member. And so what you say will be perceived as coming from the board and then you run the risk. Now, if you have two different accounts, 
you know, and you're a member of that listserv two ways. And that's maybe you can fudge it that way. But I would want to get a little uh, legal input on that one. You mean by using my private email? That could be. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that brings up another point. Um, it, while not 100% related to this, use your school emails for your board business. I trust you all have them. Um, and I cannot tell you uh, how much of a pain in the neck it would be if you had somebody want to make a public records request about your school, your school board communication. And if you don't separate them out, you've got to turn over everything. It's sort of what happened to Hillary Clinton with that server. And all of a sudden, all of the wedding plans for Chelsea's wedding were public knowledge. And not that anybody cared, but it's because in order to turn over the public things, she also had to turn over the private things because she crossed a line. So keep it clean. You know, most email platforms allow you to forward from one to another. So you can do that without your even noticing that it's a difference. You don't have to go checking in two different places, right? You can have it all streamlined and just make sure you're, when you're sending something out, it's going out under the correct email address. This is one of my favorite sayings. Board meetings are public meetings, but they are not a meeting of the public. I may have even said that last time. So public meeting, you have your business to do. Public is there to observe what's going on. They have an opportunity to comment. And that's that. It, it, you're not in a big open dialogue with everybody who's seated in the room. That's not what a board meeting is for. A board meeting is for conducting the business as specified on the agenda. And those are just the statutory references. Yes, yeah, Sarah. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's perfect timing. Look, we're up to questions. So um, because we have these hybrid meetings now where there are people, uh, the public present, but they're present virtually and they make comments throughout the um, you know, write them in the comment section of the uh, virtual meeting. Is does is the board under any responsibility to read them aloud, to, to uh, respond to them, to do anything with them? That's a good question. Um, if you have that comment channel open, then anybody at the meeting can see the comments. Correct. As long as they're so, if you're. If you're attending the meeting uh, physically at the school where we would do them, and I don't have my personal computer with me, then no, I, well, I guess they go up on the screen. I don't know. You have to be pretty good to find them quickly. Um, right. But um, um, I'll have to research that and I will get back through Chris. I'll let you know what I come up with. Okay. Yep. Um, because they would only be shared with people at the meeting and that you know unlike minutes which are then posted for a year for everybody well and it's i mean and also in the case where if you're attending the meeting you would not be allowed to make a and if you were attending in person you there would not you would have the opportunity to speak only during public comment right but if you're attending it virtually then sometimes people you know uh feel they have the right to comment and 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 that we have to read it and we have to respond because and that's not an option that's available to people who attend uh, in person. Right. And so, um, you know, obviously we want to replicate the live meeting as best we can. Um, now, it's possible after your public comment period on your agenda, I, I don't know about Google Meets. I'm not as familiar here, but I wonder, I know in some of the platforms you can close the chat. Oh. And that takes care of that, you know. Well, we could publicly announce that also. Right. Right. Thank you. Sure. Stacy. Hi. Um, so to follow on Sarah's question, I 
click these meetings and I generally will copy and paste whatever is in the chat just into the minutes mm -hmm. um, into the public comment area I don't know whether that's appropriate as Sarah said sometimes people really you know oh. chat about the you take their like they like live blog um, right their thoughts about the meeting as it's happening um, so I don't know if that's appropriate uh, but I did want to mentioned that I do try and capture those. Okay. And then you. I and also I'll find out what what the um, strict interpretation of open meeting law is with respect to that, if there is Thanks. one. And then I also wanted to ask about um, virtual participation. Um, so you mentioned that you have to identify yourself. Sometimes we have two people sitting behind a screen and it'll have one person's name and someone else will pop up and you know, it'll be a family member who also wants to add comment. Um, I'm assuming that's okay as long as that person identifies. Mm -hmm. and, okay. and really the more important piece of that identifying is that board members identify yourselves, okay? Um, and I, you know, some, some of the public participation, again, it varies by platform, but some platforms have the opportunity to have um, participants and observers. And there's sort of two categories of um, people attending the meeting. And the observers usually can't unmute and speak, but they can type into the chat when they have a question. Um, and so that's another way to try to control some of that action as well. Because I, I've heard stories of um, you know, unruly meetings that are hybrid and somebody from the public has something they want to say and they feel it's the time to say it and they just have at it and it's really disruptive and it completely derails the meeting and the board work so you want to be careful about that too thank you yeah, Susan. Andrew. sure andrew um i had a question about uh subcommittee meetings so yep. they're supposed to have um you know an agenda uh, agendas and mm -hmm. minutes and stuff um for subcommittees that have a sort of informal membership how do you do quorums and things like that i mean i guess there's no action usually taken at these meetings they're usually kind of discussion to bring back to the board for mm -hmm. can you action. give me an example of a informal I mean, right now, informal membership well like an example would be right now we're having a subcommittee to discuss preschool expanded hours and you know we kind of did a first meeting with a small member people of the board but then figured out a bunch of other people that we'd like to invite and so you know there's not i think it's going to be kind of a, as a sort of ad hoc who's going to be there and who's not there's kind of a core group but we're asking people to come in and help out so if that core group is all board members, is that what I'm hearing? No, it's like no, it's not. Members. It's mostly administration, faculty, community. Okay, it's only got one board member. Is it a committee a, of the board? It's a task no, force. Say it's a task force for the administration. Then that's a different matter. These are board committees I'm talking okay. about okay. that have board charter as for their tasks. Okay. Thank you for that question. It's a good distinction and an important one to remember. I think I'm over my time. How are we doing on questions? Again, for those of you for whom this was an early or first exposure to open meeting law, I really encourage you to take some time and watch or listen at least to the webinar that's on our website. Um, because it, there's a lot of good information in there. Um, we have a webinar archive page and it's accessible through that. This is me. I want to thank you again. I have told Chris, um, I know you're into budgets wholeheartedly now. And so we're taking a hiatus in this. And actually when we resume in the spring, I will be gone. <laughs> I am retiring at the end of this year. So I have yet to find out how we're going to handle the balance of these meetings. For all I know, I'll come back and be, you know, do them with you again, which I'm happy to do. But I have yet to work out some of those details with BSBA. I assure you somebody will be here to share with you on, on the remainder of the topics that we scoped out. Thank you very much. Thank you. And again, you. if you have questions after you think about it, 
Just shoot me Thank an you. email. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Chris. <laughs> Never been in love with Jamie as a name, anyway. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So, uh, public comments. Here. Do we have public comments? Any public comments tonight? Not here. Not here. No. no. Any public comments online? Please raise your hand or star six to unmute. Going once, going twice. Okay, guys, we're going to move on. Reports to the board. Uh, good evening. Uh, you have my handwritten report. Um, I just want to emphasize again that we had planned to warn and look to adopt policy tonight, but after the policy committee met, um, it was it's a 10 day notice we have to have in the paper on policy. Uh, adoption so we didn't make that so one of the things uh, I want to talk about under that policy part and when you get to next agenda is whether or not the SU board wants to take up a special meeting and or they could warn this for action prior to a retreat the retreat is on the agenda so far I've only had eight responses just to put a plug into that Google form I sent and four out of the eight said Saturdays are not a great day so we're still without a date. Um, and if folks are wondering why Saturday felt better than Friday, and we're back to, we're through committee meetings and uh, board meetings, we're back, to, we're back to about four nights a week right now. So it really is Fridays or Saturdays, just so you know. Um, just because we're in the thick of budget, negotiation, supervision, evaluation and uh, other committee work we have going on across the SU. So, um, but we'll get to that later. I'm working diligently still to try to uh, make certain we can execute tests to stay. Um, I am starting to receive some interest of folks that would be willing to help us in certain districts implement that. Um, I'm also still looking to bring on two more full-time medical assistants for the remainder of the year to help us navigate uh, COVID-19. Um, we are having positivity still in our schools. Um, it's been isolated. We've been able to work diligently. The medication efforts work. Um, we're not seeing spread within the school, but we certainly are seeing positivity come into the school. Um, and with that is a significant amount of work that it places on a pretty small team of folks um and i will tell you that you know we had positivity uh in four different locations sorry three different locations last week which results in a, a huge lift of the wrvs covid 19 team and so um i am hoping that we can get some additional folks on because i'm really concerned about burnout at this point and we're only in october um, so if you said to me, Jamie, what's the biggest difference this year versus last? It's actually the manpower and energy we're putting into contact tracing is like quadruple compared to what we did as an SU last year. Quick question. Which yes. districts do you need the MAs in? And um, do they, are you looking for someone who is a certified medical assistant or just someone with some training experience at a minimum for, yeah at a minimum we're looking for someone who's a uh, um certified emer emergency medical technician okay um and we're looking for two that would be hired at the su level so that they could go to triage if we have positivity within a district to assist um, but then they also would help because many of our nurses right now due to contact tracing are severely behind in regards to the other duties that they have day to day. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're finding that they're having a big difficulty keeping up, frankly, right now. Um, and so the idea would be that we would have two folks that we could deploy across the SU to relieve the day to day pressure so that our nurses could get caught up. 
Yeah, I was wondering, it, they're so hard to find right now. So I was wondering about bringing someone who may be retired, you know, like bring them back into the fold, but I'm not sure their, their licensing would be up to date. So that would be a concern, I guess. No, I, I don't need them to actually be currently licensed. Actually, a retired medical professional would be ideal. Right. Uh, and they would work under the licensure of our actual school nurse. Um, and our school nurses can delegate duties uh, per statute. So certainly not being currently in license, but having that background training would serve us just fine. Okay. I have a few retired so, no, nurses. Someone, please I'm send them my way. <laughs> oh, please send them my way. Out. Yeah, I've been telling them doing that. Jamie, or Kevin, yes. Uh, just a quick question: uh, Could you just repeat? Was that I, I? I I missed the part where you're losing some people on the board or for contact tracing. What was that? You were really looking not just the medical technicians. It was the last part of your report. No, I'm not losing anyone. I'm really concerned about fatigue right now. Ah, thank but you. That's that's our fair. our COVID nineteen team is i would say significantly fatigued I, i'm really worried about burnout hmm. is there anything we can do if you can send anyone you know that may qualify like i just said as an emt or a medical assistant someone with a background in allied health sciences that would be helpful thank you I guess the only other thing is I would say is um, just as a board being just really aware that your administrators are maxed right now as well. Uh, I, I will tell you this year is significantly harder than last year. Your teachers are stressed, the system's stressed. And I would say that you just please, if you have a request, go through me. And please, because that chain of command is going to be important because many of your principals are uh, running ragged at the moment. Um, and I don't, I mean that in an endearing way. That's not meant to be critical. Um, I'm just saying that it's, they're just, they're working really hard. So please just reach out. Thanks, Dave. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, uh, you also have my written report, so I can just give some highlights and entertain any questions on it. Um, I'll talk later about the SU-wide uh, universal screening data report, and so I won't spend too much, I won't spend any time on that here because we'll spend some time on that in a few minutes. Um, but just to add to that, what you will see there is the, the aggregate SU level uh, data, and so it's important just to remember in addition to that, which is what we look at at this level, the you know the teachers and schools are looking at the data sort of at uh, deeper levels because they're looking at uh, student-specific data, class-specific data, and all of that's really important for making decisions around how they're going to uh, address any needs they see instructionally, how they might um, do small you know small group interventions, anything like that. So I just I always want to make sure when we're looking at sort of high level data, we remember that there's a lot that's going on in the classroom and at the school level uh, around those assessments and using that information to help students grow. Um, I also referenced the, the work in math. We've talked a lot about sort of the, the different resources that we brought in around math. And so one of the things we'll be pairing that with this year is work on the SU level, uh, grade level proficiencies, and looking and making sure we have coherence, you know, across uh, all of our all of our grades and, and all of our schools, and looking at the learning scales and performance indicators there. And I think that will help us make sense of the um, the materials that we have coming into our into our classrooms, and make sure that um, when we've got kids at different schools who then feed into a single school, that those experiences are more equitable, and um, we have kind of the high level expectations of kids at all of our schools. Uh, and then the last piece of the report is just around the, the work we've been doing with the Tarrant Institute. This has been um, really fun to see it uh, sort of pick up some um, speed in the last couple of weeks. Uh, they've done a lot of work with a middle school in Bethel around flexible pathways and personalized learning, as well as with uh, um, 
Tunbridge and Chelsea uh, as part of the, the first branch and the restructuring there. And now we'll start working with uh, the Newton School and just thinking really around what's that um, pretty unique experience for students that are in the middle school and middle year grades and um, making sure it's a really uh, enriching experience um, and rigorous for all those students. So it's a great partnership uh, working with them around that. So thank you. Any questions? All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. And you're up. All right, hi everyone. Um, so uh, I feel like October went by really quickly. Um, so we've had some more training with the Clara Martin Center and some more coming up on Friday. Um, also to go along with what some of what Ando was just talking about with the Taryn Institute um, in middle school around personalized learning plans and flexible pathways. I think those conversations have now started to open up um, in our um, department as well. Um, principals and teachers um, are now really opening up and branching out with those kind of conversations. And we've been doing a lot of planning for students um, who need specialized instruction, um, real deep modifications of work. Um, so we've been using that work um, in our field as well. So it's been a nice connection and a nice follow through. Uh, also, um, we started to see an up uptick in applications um, for our paraprofessional department. Um, so we're starting to reach capacity and I'm pretty excited about that. <laughs> um, and also we were um, able to hire another special educator who will be starting after Thanksgiving. Um, and I have a, another potential special educator in the pipeline, which I'm super excited about. Um, so we're definitely getting there um, with the capacity in our department. Um, one other thing, because we're talking about um, the conversations around budget and we're starting to think about budget, um, just something new um, that you know, I wanted to make you all aware of is that um, the state is gonna start um, administering uh, special education funding through a block grant system, um, which is based on the total size of your school's student population uh, previously, uh, the state did like a, a reimbursement to districts uh, for special education based on the number of students in special education programs. So what this is going to look like, we're all still waiting to hear. Um, the business office, myself, even the superintendent, we're all still waiting um, to see and hear what this is actually going to look like. Um, but this will be the, the funding system from for now on. Um, starting with the, the next school year. Any questions? Everybody's all good? All right. Ray, you're up. Sure. I hope I haven't had a chance to review my report, and I would entertain any questions that you may have. Any questions for Ray? Uh, Sarah has I don't have a question, but I just would like to say that Ray, you just you do do an outstanding job for us in our meetings. And when um, I make a request for a subcommittee meeting, you you know just to get all that stuff out and be so that we can just click on a button and and have people attend virtually. I just I know it's a lot. Um, this virtual or this you know, uh, COVID environment is different, is, is created a lot of work for all of everyone, but I would especially like to comment that I think you're, you're doing an outstanding job for us. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. It's a team effort and uh, I uh, would like to just respond back and say that, um, trying to choose my words carefully, it's a very good team. Thank you. I agree. Thank you, Ray. Uh, okay. Last but not least, Sarah. Thank you. Hi, everyone. You have my report. I have just a couple of updates I want to provide. Uh, we're still on target to have our audits the third and fourth week of November. The auditors continue to work through the last few items that they have remotely. And then 
we are still waiting for guidance from the Agency of Education on our ARP ESSER 3 funding. The application hasn't been released to us yet, so we can start to apply for that. We've got some additional guidance in last week on what we need to do for community engagement, which Onda can go over in further detail. Uh, but the state is waiting for additional guidance on their end also from the legislature. So that's where we're at. And then I'll rejoin later on in the meeting and discussion item. So if you want to provide any additional information. Yeah, so just to, to build off that on the, the ARP ESSER or ESSER 3 grant, we are, as Tara said, still waiting um, to even have an application. We, won't, we don't have that yet from the AOE. The piece that we do have, um, which came out in sort of the, the rules from the, the federal government is um, guidance around the how do we do uh, stakeholder and, and public uh, engagement in it. So more information will be coming out from that. We have done a fair amount of that in developing the recovery plan uh, in the spring. Um, and so what we'll want to do at this point is, is just make sure that um, we've got kind of all of the groups that we um, want covered that are applicable for this, for this SU um, and have any updated information um, in the time that's passed sort of since the end of the spring till, till now as we um, think about how we want to use this additional set of funding uh, to meet our needs. We're also in a different place than we were in the spring in terms of, um, you know, where we are with COVID. So we, we have to, we'll have to make some adjustments there. We have more costs in some areas than I think we expected. So all of that will be, will be updated, but I know that that's a, um, a big piece of our uh, budget going forward. And we just are, everyone is sort of in a waiting pattern across the state waiting for that uh, approval um, and the release of the application. And we, they keep saying soon, but it's like nothing more specific than that. So that's what we're working with. Any questions for, for Tara's report? All right, um, policies on uh, 9.1 F27 revised bids, quotations, procurements policy. Yeah, so the policy committee took a look at this and was good to move this forward. Again, we, we weren't able to warn these in the paper, uh, but the change around this was that the bid law for the state actually changed and it allowed us to go to a $40,000 threshold. Um, and COVID was part of this reasoning is my understanding of the legislature to take, that, take action on this so that schools could go forward and move on projects um, and not to have to to wade through the bid law, which often we get held up because we don't always receive three bids. We end up getting one, which then requires an AOE waiver, and it just, uh, frankly, is kind of a bureaucratic nightmare. And so this would align us to the $40,000 threshold that now is provided via legislation um, out of Montpelier. So you'll see really what changed, none of the wording changed other than the um, bid law that was it originally at 10, 15,000 15, has increased to 40, and the micro purchasing, I believe, went through from 3,500 to 40. Micro purchase went from 10. Yes, yeah, sorry, 35. It was yeah. 10 on the other form. Yep. Okay. Thank you. So I don't know if there's any thoughts or comments about that. I'm, I'm hoping that folks will be willing to um, give me a date today before we leave about when we could look to warn this for a special meeting to possibly just do these two things or to do this and then piggyback on a retreat. But that's that part. Any thoughts, comments, questions about policy F27? That's just a revision so we could take action on it um, after warning 10 days in the paper. All right, looks like we're good with that one. Okay, um, and the next one is the anti-racism policy, draft number five, amended. Everybody should have received an updated copy. Um, it's moved out of the committee. I believe the committee has done its work on it, and um, this is our final version that we're bringing to the board. So any changes, discussions will take place at the board level now. So this is policy labeled C30. And uh, so it does have a policy ID now, we'll see. And, um, you know, I think that policy committee members could jump in 
But really what happened was based on hearing uh, comments and discussion at the full board level about wanting the policy to be focused on policy and to not include procedures, um, the policy committee took action to move most of the procedures actually into policy. The discussion was that a majority of the procedure was policy when you took a deeper dive into it. Um, and so that's what they did. Anything to add from the policy committee on that? There was no other change other than what I just described of moving procedures into policy. Uh, Jamie, the only other thing was that the one the one procedure that was in there was the anti-racism statement, which was laid out and it was said, you know, we said where we, it was going to be posted and what it was going to say and all that. And that really was a procedure. Um, so we took that out and just charged Jamie or the superintendent working with the anti-racism committee to um, to come up with uh, that statement. So that's the only other thing. All right. Any more discussion around that? Okay. Um, can I just, and we can, we can set the date later. Are folks interested in setting a special meeting to get these uh, approved? I mean, it needs to be a course 10 days out from Thursday because that's the earliest I could warn it in the Herald. Um, but is there a sentiment around wanting to do that or folks just wanna wait until next month? I just, I need to make certain I hit the paper at the right time, that's all. You have a question, Dan? Stacy? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to advocate for having that meeting. Um, the policy committee has met a bunch of extra times. We've done a lot of work. I would love to get these through um, without waiting another month. Um, if possible, um, I know it does involve asking everyone to come out for another meeting, but um, I do, I do don't think that we should do it in conjunction with a retreat, though, because I think I think that there's going to be a lot of public and a lot of comment, I agree. and it would not it would eat into our time to do what we want to do as a board retreat. I agree very much, uh, but I would advise getting something on the calendar for as soon as we can. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I agree with Stacy. Uh, I can't see that. Right, but. Should we? Are we throwing dates out? <clears throat> November fourth, Thursday. Well, you got the board calendar there. I mean, we're a bit limited. Oh, yep. And that's before Thursdays start happening for negotiations. It, uh, so Thursday about, night tends to be the best. Are you going to be by the fourth? Are you in negotiations? We're going to try to start pulling that committee together pretty quickly. Yeah. Well, I mean, could the we? The fourth doesn't give me enough time. Um, oh, it doesn't? We okay. need 10 days. Gotcha. What about? The Is six? the eighth taken? Policy. That's policy. Okay. Could we? Could we the policy committee? Yeah, could the policy committee give up that meeting? To we could do that if folks could commit to the eighth. I could, I could do that. Uh, I would be willing to give up the policy committee meeting for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's really policy committee work, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's like, that would be great, and we'll do a special just for that. Okay. And, and I'll then, get it in the paper Thursday. Perfect. Just so you know, so, but I don't. Um, I'm, I'm unavailable the eighth through the eighteenth. So, but. Six p.m. Six p.m. <sighs> Great. Good. Be right. We're good yeah. to go. Okay. Sharon, gotcha. Look at us going, guys. We're we all almost on the bottom of the page. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everybody, to work so hard on this. Things are up again. I'm great. <laughs> all right. I'm here to talk uh, about the, <clears throat> the universal screening that we did in September uh, across all of our schools. Uh, Ray is going to pull up. I just made a couple of slides to make it a little bit easier to see the graphs. I think uh, hopefully you had a chance to look at it on your um, on your own. A couple of things that are important um, for just understanding the report. So 
We use a number of different assessments. A lot of them have been laid out in the kind of assessment calendar that we sent out earlier in the year. Um, some of them are uh, better sort of for using across all schools and, and, and tracking uh, in sort of this uh, kind of regular way across the course of the year. So the STAR 360, which um, I believe you've been looking at for a couple of years now, uh, is one of them. We have added a, a, a second um, assessment system called Track My Progress, which uh, is, is for the same purposes, and we're just trying it out at two schools this year. So um, in some of this data, you're going to see sort of two sets of results. They're not, you can't compare them to each other because they are sitting on different systems. So we'll look at that. But they are, we believe they're sort of assessing the same, the same um, content for our students. Um, I think that's the, and then we'll look at this data again in February and then at the end of the year and um, be part of how we monitor progress across the whole, the whole SU. So the first slide here is the, the uh, data for reading, we use this assessment for grades three through 10. Um, and this is the basic sort of proficiency, whether they sort of are, um, students are meeting the proficiency uh, benchmark for the fall um, or, or not. And so it's a, it's a kind of that binary um, that cut off. And overall, you can see across grades three through 10, 51% of our kids are, um, and it's, there's a relative, like relative consistency across all grade levels. Um, we do, you know, you see a, a little bit of a drop down there in grade six. Um, so that's making, you know, making us wonder. Um, grade six is, you know, um, looks different in all of our schools. In some, in, you know, it's a middle school. It might be part of an elementary school. So it's an area where um, we could do some good work across the SU and figure out, you know, where, where's Grade six, you know, really working well for our kids. Where can we learn some lessons? So it's a, it's a, um, it does stick out as being kind of in a, it's in multiple places. Um, and then uh, we, I think we talked about it a little bit at our last meeting. We do have assessment data on grades one and two. We don't have this kind of data for them, but these assessment um, platforms do offer uh, the assessments for that grade level. So um, we're going to probably test drive some of that in some of our schools in the, uh, at the next round and see if we get information that we think is helpful, how our students do. It is, it is a computer adaptive test, so there are some reasons why we don't do it for kids, but our kids are coming in increasingly more, um, more facile on the computers at that age. And so there, there could be an argument now that we wouldn't have made a couple of years ago for doing that, um, that assessment with a younger grade. So we'll, we'll try that out and, and, and be back and see um, if that gives us information that's helpful for understanding where our kiddos are at that level. Um, I just pulled into this slideshow the, the results from the spring state summit of in reading, just so you would see um, sort of where we were close to the end of the year last year, we looked at this, this is the same data we looked at in, um, at the beginning of the year in August when we looked at that result. And that's just so you can see, um, again, we're the darker line and the lighter line is the scaled score for meeting expectations. And this is on average. So, um, you know, there are places where we are pretty close to that, places where we're a little bit further away. If you go to the next slide, um, you can see it's a little bit hard with the, um, uh, but this is again the same as in the report. Uh, the darker line again is our schools and the lighter line is what has been established as the state benchmark for the fall. And so in a lot of places we're tracking really closely to that. Um, uh, I think that one of that shows that we don't have, we maybe didn't have a huge summer slide, which I think is good. We had a lot of good programming going on at one planet in other places. We've, so that's, it's good if you saw, we saw, if we saw, it's not exactly the same test obviously, but if we saw a big change, um, we'd have some more concerns about what was going on in the summer. So that's that's good. And again, this is where I was <laughs> explaining earlier, track my progress. Uh, schools are that lower line, Star 360 are the higher line. They've just established different scaled scores for their tests. It's not that one test is a lot harder or a lot easier than the other. They've just, they're two different companies. So I, I can't combine them. Um, but they're both being tracked against uh, what is established as a state benchmark trying to be predictive of how students would do at the end of the year on the summer note. So in reading, again, I think we are pretty, pretty close to the, uh, where we, where we want to be on an average and, and in some places, you know, we want to be exceeding that. So any questions on, should I just keep going through? If anyone has questions, please just kind of raise, raise your hand. Um, you don't have to hold it till the very end. We've got the same set of slides looking at math. So math, we actually do start testing at in first grade. So we have data for first through 10th grade. Again, this is an area that we have not been focusing on 
with the same, you know, the same concentration of literacy um, across the SU before this year. And I think we'll, you know, we'll, we are hoping that a lot of the, the time and resources we're investing in math will start to shift this picture. Um, overall, we've got about a third of kids are meeting or exceeding in the expectations. Um, and there's a lot more um, change across the grade level. So it's not as, you know, not as consistently around um, some places, you know, the grades are looking a lot stronger than other places. Um, we are pretty impressed with uh, how our grade one did, you know, their first shot at this. And so looking at, you know, what, you know, what are they coming in with from kindergarten and how do we build on that foundation? Because they clearly got some, um, some really good foundational skills um, for us to work with. Um, and then we do see uh, quite a, a pretty good drop off in middle school. Uh, we do have a lot, a much smaller number of kids, especially in our seventh and eighth grade cohorts. So again, so that as soon as your group gets smaller, that um, you know the, the numbers get a little bit noisier because a little bit of change will um, reflect more, look bigger. Um, but I still think we have uh, some work to do around looking at the, both the curriculum and the instructional practices in the in the in the middle school grades to make sure that we've got high expectations and, and teaching that matches that to um, to uh, improve that sort of that score. Uh, this again is the score from the spring, the S back the state summative. And so uh, you saw this in August, it's uh, pretty far <laughs> off of the, of the scaled score for meeting expectations. And then if we look at um, the scaled score for the, the screening in the fall, go ahead and flip the next one. Uh, the gap is not so big. Again, it's not necessarily exactly the same scale. Um, but you can see really that in the elementary grades, we're tracking along pretty well. The middle grades start to really see that gap. Um, and then a little bit of a, a, a tail back in um, when we hit ninth and 10th grade. So, um, you know, we'll certainly have our focus on the middle, all the grades, but um, with a special attention to middle school and see what we can do um, to close that gap from a systems perspective. So I'll just, I'll just add, I just want to remind, <coughs> excuse me, remind the board, we're in just starting year three of our literacy work. And, you know, research would really say it takes three to five years for this type of change to really take hold. So I want folks to hear, we have not taking our foot off the gas pedal around literacy at all. All right, it is absolutely focused on that. In addition to saying, we have to serve our students really well in mathematics. Um, I will tell you that expectations therefore have increased. I think there is a greater pressure on our journalist teachers at the elementary level. I think they would tell you that. So I will echo that for them. That doesn't mean though that we ha don't have to be really sound in both literacy and mathematics. Um, and oh, by the way, we do need to start to focus at science at some point here as well, right? And so um, what I will tell you is that in literacy, there's really two things we're focusing on. It's really on strengthening our core content knowledge in phonics, and then it's going to be on writing. Okay, we've got good practices in general around what a strong literacy block looks like and around guided reading. That work is still in place and we'll continue to implement it with fidelity. But those are the other two pieces in literacy. And then in math, we're just starting this launch. This is just year one. And so our focus is on strengthening teacher content knowledge. It was making certain that we have common core aligned materials. I will tell you, we did it in some places. It's also making certain we have the same common materials in a building. We had multiple buildings where we were not using the same materials. So we had multiple programs within a building. And so those are the steps we're taking right now in mathematics. We also were not teaching math for an hour a day. And so what we know is that we need at least 60 minutes a day of explicit math instruction and support if we want to really get to what we want to get to in regards to the Common Core State Standards. And so one of the things we did when I shared back in May those uh, non-negotiables around our multi-tiered system of supports, a bunch of those non-negotiables were focused on establishing just some minimum instructional requirements. Because we know if we want to meet student need, universal instruction, instruction for all is where it's at. We can't fix the fact that 33, only 33% 33 of our students are meeting the expectation through intervention. Intervention is not gonna solve that. 
right? It's going to be high quality, universal instruction from the classroom teacher. And so that's where we're focusing. Um, we have implemented math intervention as well, uh, because we do know that we need to have targeted math interventionists. And um, what I would say to you is, is that there are some schools that started this work more so last year. And I think if you look at our elementary math data, you'll start to see that we are closing that gap more, which is a positive. I said that was a real celebration when it on that I was sitting down because I felt like some of that work that we had started in certain schools last year is paying off already. Um, so I would expect us to see the data change uh, more swiftly in math than you're necessarily going to see in literacy this year in year three, but we should continue to see literacy grow. Um, if we start to plateau, then we're going to have to d dive deeper because that would be a problem. We're not at a place where these, with this data should plateau. And when you look at the goals, they speaks to the fact that we have to continue to grow. Maybe uh, just one more comment on this, on this data before we move to the next section or any, or any questions is just to a note that the, the benchmark scale scores that you're looking at in each of those graphs that we are, you know, that we are, we're sort of trying to aim for as our average. Um, those are, I guess the best way to say is they're seasonal. They're for right now. So that's where, that's where kids are expected to grow. So those will shift when we come back in, um, in February and show and show and present on the January data, those numbers will all have gone up because they will have accounted for student growth over that time. I just don't want you to, Say that we're trying to like move in the, the goalpost because it, it just it does it gets moved so every um the scale score is trying to mentor like where kids should be right now in the school year where they should be in the middle of the year where they should be by the end of the year and so that's that's how those numbers will change thank you all right anything on that before we move to the, oh. the next one uh, yeah so, right, the next one goes it yeah it's, that okay just to go up to the next one here. yeah okay so I, we were tasked at the end of the what month were you, at the end of the september meeting um to come up with some proposed uh goals uh specifically talking about achievement um that that you all could uh talk about as a as a um as an su board um and think about it uh, whether we would set these as sort of the our goals for the for the coming year so um we went back and uh, looked at sort of that conversation and what we um, were proposed. And here are the three that we are um, are proposing right now is there with some, some intermediate roles in between there. So the first one, and again, we talked a lot about the skill score, but it would be that for all the grades assessed on the statewide summative assessment, that our, all of our schools will attain an average scale score that exceeds the proficient range in ELA and an average scale score that was within the proficient range in mathematics. The difference in those, um, those goals is, is based on kind of where we are currently. We do see that our performance in ELA is higher. We were, um, I think at least a couple of people mentioned trying to you know, stretch these goals. So um, we, we set it to exceed and we can look at um, a little bit later what that means between, in terms of exceeding the range and within the range. Um, we talked a lot about average and that's an important way to look at the whole system. Um, and making sure that everyone's moving up. But we, um, we also have, you know, particular concern for um, students who are, you know, scoring in what is considered level one or not yet meeting expectations. That's, um, and so really paying close attention to those kids um, and trying to reduce that, that number of kids in that group by half um, by 2025. So that would be fewer than 15% of students in um, scoring level one in ELA and fewer than 20% of students scoring level one in math. Um, and then the third goal, again, I think came out of the conversation that we had in September. We don't necessarily have the right assessment um, right now to, to create a new, uh, numerical goal, but that we'd have, um, that we'd have all students in grades K to two acquiring foundational skills in literacy and math that set them up for success in later grades. So that is phrased in really more of a placeholder way. As I mentioned earlier, we're looking at test driving sort of the, the computer adaptive assessments in grades one and two. Um, for reading, and uh, I think if that turns out to be something that works well, and we don't and we don't have any concerns with that, then I think that we would base our we look to um, in the in the spring get that data, and then set a goal 
that would then um, be going forward after that. So that's um, that's where we are right now. I think the next. Um, so this is, I think I showed this in the, in the, in September, this is, comes out of the state's every, uh, Vermont's Every Student Succeeds Act plan, and where they set these four levels of performance, and you can see sort of where they've got the proficient scale score, the midpoint, and above the upper, kind of the upper bound. The numbers in here were developed in 2016, so these are not necessarily the most current numbers, and we believe numbers will be released by the state in January, um, and that's we probably would use to set the goal for 2025. But this, just to give you an idea, when we talk about being within the proficiency range or being or trying to exceed it, it would look it would be kind of drawing off of um, numbers in a in a chart like this. All right, next one. Um, and then also just because we're setting out that goal at 2025 again, that's what the state has done in their in their plan. Also setting some interim targets. Um, by taking the difference between our current performance and that goal, um, and then you know dividing it up evenly across the four years between now and 2025. Again, these numbers may change as we get updated um, information from the from the state, but it would still be the it would, we'd still set the same process for determining kind of the interim targets and the and the final goal. Uh, and the same thing for math. So I don't think the individual numbers are probably not that important. You can see with math that the goal is, you know, the each each year we've got sort of a a bigger a bigger um, space to grow, and because um, we're just start starting at a bit of a lower spot there. Uh, and then around the second goal, this is thinking about um, really moving as many more kids out of that level one performance range. So it would be looking at how many we have currently in um, in level one. That was 29% of our kids in. Uh, ELA and 41% of our kids in math, um, reducing that in half, uh, and then again trying to set interim targets uh, by dividing that over the four years. And then the last one again is is more of a placeholder based really thinking about those foundational skills that our kids in uh, K2 um, have before they sort of head into the, the middle, um, the upper elementary and into middle school. And the plan would be to have a dashboard on our SU website that communicates this and that those interim targets, we would highlight where we've been meeting or exceeding and or not meeting the benchmark. Um, so that that information would be public and easily accessible, not just in a report, like you could click on a tab and this would be updated and live. Um, and we're looking to redo our websites over the next year as it is anyways, just, just to remind folks. So that's a feature that I think we could we could definitely try to look to implement. And maybe just one other sort of comment is maybe a bit better with the, earlier with the achievement report, but I, I think we it is important just to remember with all of this, and I especially think about any of sort of the teachers who may be, may be listening in, that we are still like fully aware that we are in, in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and that, uh, you know, a lot of the expectations that come out in these tests and in the state reports don't necessarily reflect that. There's not really a numerical way to reflect what has happened I mean, um, over the last 18 months and, you know, what will continue to happen is, you know, kids have to miss school uh, if they get sick and that sort of thing. So I just, I, I just say that because I think I want to make sure, you know, it, it is something that is on top of mind all the time for us is that we are keeping high expectations for kids and also really recognizing that um, it is a, it is more than a challenging time for them. And, and that some of the ways that we measure performance have not adjusted. Um, and so we have to just keep in mind as we're thinking about, you know, what, what are the things that we're doing? What are we pushing on? Our kids need the best education they can get. They need our best instruction. Um, and we have to understand it's within this wider context that we don't have much experience in, except for the last uh, the last number of months. So. Yeah. Any questions? I think Megan had a hand up. Hi, Megan. Megan, do you have a question? Hi, just a quick question. I just was thinking when you're talking about um, looking for a, a way to assess the younger kids, I'm just thinking about the time that they're spending, you know, they may be competent on the um, computer, but considering measuring how much time they're spending with a screen. And I'm wondering if that's part of the conversation as you think about how to present those numbers. Yeah, no, I think that's a, I think that's a really good point. A lot of the, um, a lot of the, I mean, the computer adaptive tests we have 
especially on this newer platform we have, how much time each kid is taking on the test. So I think that is that will be an important part to see. Is this something that is, you know, that that is taking relatively little time compared to the the time they're spending in school, or is it something that is taking up a you know a lot more time? So I think um, that's a good point and can be part of sort of when we look at uh, overall what um, what platform we want to go with. I think that's a good one to to be thinking about. Um, as we move towards uh, the proficiency-based grading, I mean, basically the teachers will be providing updates on how they, I mean, each report card, basically how many proficiencies they think each kid has. Like, is that something we could use for the K to two group? Yeah, I think that, yeah, I think that would be helpful. I think there's a lot of, I mean, I think a lot of rich conversation around um, what, yeah, what the proficiencies are and how to, how to, sort of assess them um, could make it really, yeah, a rich time to do that too. Yeah, yeah I guess like it I... difficult to compare between teachers and buildings maybe, but so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there. I think, yeah, I think there's sometimes that's the, I mean, we hope to have the same, we hope to have the same proficiencies across our, you know, our buildings because they are, um, you know, the, they are sort of at a level of where, you know, all, you know, all students are, are getting there. Um, and I think the, the calibration of between teachers, which is also what we work on when we think about the benchmark assessment system, the reading that all of our students um, in the younger grades do, but it's not necessarily great for reporting out because they haven't all been sort of calibrated in the same way, you know, a computer test has been. So that's, that's the balance. Some of the times that gives us more information on the classroom and the student level, but not necessarily helpful system-wide information. So I think that's, but it's a good, I think having these ideas are, are good for as we, figure out exactly what's the right um, thing to measure sort of our progress on. Anybody else? I have um, oh. a question. I really like this and where we're going and this is really where the rubber hits the road. Um, we're working so hard um, in so many ways and I'm not talking about myself, I'm talking about the people that are in the front lines in the classroom. Um, but we really need to know what the score is and we need to have a target of what the score should be. And so we can, we can truly measure. And so I'm really, really uh, excited about what we heard tonight and the superintendents say, not only are we talking about this at a board level or the district board level, but I want to have it right on the website. Uh, create a dashboard so that the parents um, and the community members are trying to figure out is this worth it? Or this this public education effort is it worth what we're asking them to pay? Um, they can see uh, the results, um, and and some will be will be you know marching up and down. Other ones we're going to be be challenging. But I just think that is the way to go. Um, uh, I didn't see the material you just presented in the packet, so I uh, and I don't have my long range glasses, so I appreciate through the chair if you could make that available uh, to all uh, SU board members and district board members because I think it's so 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 important and that we Kathy that we continue this agenda uh, meeting at our next meeting where we've had a chance to look at and think about um, what's been presented tonight um, because at some point I I believe the board should 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 say, yeah, this is this should be our SU goals for this year and the interim for the next. It doesn't mean next year we don't change our our goals, uh, but I think that's important for the staff to say, okay, this is this is this is what we're shooting for. And um, I also told you before, also helpful if that's the goal, then we're doing our budget. Do we have a budget that's going to be able to allow us to achieve those goals going forward? And to me, that's the number one budget question. Um, so that's helpful as well. I think as far as seeing things clearly, it would be helpful. I love these graphs, but it'd be wonderful if we could see the graphs saying, okay, and here's, and I know the numbers are changed, going to be changed for the, the January scores. Um, but I still think you can show, okay, and here's our goal. Okay, now I could say the numbers are going to change, but does that mean all marks are above this. I think I heard one thing and didn't hear, but to be able to see it graphically on the, the reading and on the math, 
And the same with thing with here. Um, if we achieve our goal, how is this going to look different? Well, the blue is going to be moving in this direction. Um, and, and the orange is going to be contracting as well. So you're, and I think that for one board member, um, the, what we can kind of see what we're talking about here. And if the change is so minute that I can't see it, then I'm saying, well, is it really meaningful? Um, so those are two suggestions and I'm sure you can come up with better ones, but to the extent that the board can see what you're proposing, I didn't have a chance to kind of look at it. I, boy, I think um, this is going to be one of the, the most outstanding things uh, we have done in a long, long time. Um, and it's and it's a credit to the superintendent and his team for doing this and uh, the board supporting this. So, thank you. I agree. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to largely echo what Bill said. I, I I'm really excited seeing these goals and hearing uh, some um, enthusiasm around how we're going to meet them. I also really, really appreciate the transparency of the dashboard, um, keeping everyone updated. I would only add uh, to Anda um, that, you know, I do feel like at some, it, to, to some degree, this kind of can't just all be on the position of the educators. And if there are opportunities uh, for community engagement, be it libraries or after school programming or tutoring to, you know, help in any capacity, um, you know, you should let us know and we could see what's available in our communities. But I do think that um, it's very exciting to think that we could get here um, and to see a plan for getting there. So thanks for putting this together. Thank you. So we'll send that, what, I'm, what I think we'll do is we'll send out that slideshow and uh, we'll work on goal number three some more. Um, and then we'll look to have it on the agenda again next month for possible action. Does that sound good? Sure. Agreed. I think it sounds great. Great. All right. Sarah, we're ready. You want to take the lead, Jimmy? Sure, yeah, you can jump in. You guys know I love budget. <laughs> so it's, it's, that, it's that policy <laughs> statement that's so critical, as Bill just said. So this is, uh, again, this is our first shot, right? Uh, and this budget, this part is really focused on personnel, just so you know. Um, you're going to get much more detail in November, and then we're going to give you another one in December. If in November we're feeling like we're way off, we're probably going to need a special meeting just so you know, because we like you to adopt the SU budget in December because it drives the rest of your local budgets. So just be keeping that in mind. Um, so you, you can look at this budget and I think that there's real celebration once again where we're currently at in special education. That was increasing significantly. Um, prior to us really trying to do a better job at formalizing our system of support. So I think all the work that our classroom teachers are doing and our interventionists is paying off because if you look right now on just personnel, we're, we're at 0.2% um, from 22 to 23. And so I think that that's a huge celebration um, in the special ed realm in regards to personnel. And you may say, well, do you have enough support? I would say, absolutely. If we could get to the levels of staffing we want to be currently right now, what's budgeted in 22, mm -hmm. we'd be in good shape. I want to remind you that we're still short, right? We're gaining, but we're not at where we want to be. What we budgeted is not what we've been able to hire to this point. Um, and so that's, that's a huge celebration. We'll continue to tweak that. I don't think that that number is, you're going to see that probably change for next month. Um, and then the biggest changes above is that we are looking to um, add a position in the curriculum department underneath ONDA in this suggested budget. Um, and that is because the more that we're digging in to our curriculum right now, we're realizing it is it needs work. Uh, and what I mean by is 
clearly articulating, again, publicly and ensuring that our teachers have vertical alignment around what we expect students to know, understand, and do in each content area throughout each grade level cluster. So that it is clear what we'd expect a student to be able to do in literacy, math, um, science, global studies, physical education, at the end of grade two. Like it is clear, it's articulate, anyone can understand it. We have common rubrics that we use to measure it. We have pieces of this, but I will tell you there is a great deal of growth that needs to happen. And as we look at it and think about how do we make this happen in a really responsive way that's timely, I do believe we're gonna need extra support in that area that's focused on that book. Um, and so you'll see that there's a change in that department there, okay? Um, the, there's really not any other changes really of, the, of substance in the other departments, other than I don't want you to think we've lost the pre-K coordinator, all right? We have not lost a pre-K coordinator. What we have is, if you remember, we have Renee Hinton, that's a pre-K coordinator slash interventionist. Okay, and so that position is still in the organization. It's Renee Hinton, who you have. We just took, we used to have a fully part-time pre-K coordinator um, that was more on like an admin type contract and an interventionist, and we merged those two positions. Um, and that seems to be working well right now. And so you'll see that reflected in the budget, but I didn't want folks thinking that we lost that. If you looked in my board report, I'm actually going to continue to tout the fact that we need to continue to invest in our pre-K. Um, that, that investment is significantly um, crucial to make certain our kids have what they need to succeed and the earlier we can intervene, the better. Um, and so you'll see that the other change I will tell you that's in the special ed budget is, is that we are looking to have 2.0 triple E teachers where right now we have a 1.0 six so we're looking to increase that so we have two full-time triple e teachers to do more early intervention that's reflected in this budget just so you know uh, and that's captured in the fiscal year 23 budget um another one of the areas where we've saved some money in special education just so you know when you're looking and saying how are we keeping special ed essentially flat is we have saved um pretty significantly by partnering with our community mental health organization so by us contracting services with Claire Martin to provide therapeutic intervention in our buildings um, and for us to have case managers from Claire Martin who are able to do social emotional supports in each one of our intensive programs um, that are housed here in Royalton and Bethel. So our alternative programming that was formerly known as the restorative classroom, we used to, we used to hire private clinicians to come in and do that work where now we are able to partner with community mental health and get folks that have the same credentials, if not even a little higher, um, but at a much more affordable um, and sustainable cost. And it allows us to pipeline into all the other wraparound services that Claire Martin can offer. Um, and so that's part of where, too, we've been able to um, really see some savings uh, financially around some efficiency there. And um, the other thing, again, as I said, the budget would change. You probably saw in my report. We are identifying that we are currently right now in our system of supports lacking in regards to best supporting students who have um, kind of global cognitive delay and or who are on the autism spectrum. Um, and so we have a meeting, Annette and I and Tara, with the Central Vermont Supervisory Union, which is in uh, Norfield, Williamstown, Washington, Orange, to talk about if they had any interest in partnering um, as two supervisory unions to provide programming that would best serve those students. Um, I think we have a, a great deal of growth we need to do as a system in that area. I think that would occur, concur. Um, they feel like they do too, so I'll be able to share with you in November if that's coming to any fruition. Um, the idea would be able to better to partner to better better provide services for our students, but to do it at, and again, another, another fiscally responsible manner. Right now, 
we have to contract out for that and or look at more restrictive learning environments to meet those needs. And so we would look to try to partner to better do that um, in-house, but with a, with a collaboration across the two SUs. Um, and so those are the big highlights of the budget. I'll let Tara jump in too, but I, I want you to see the intensive program coordinator. These are covered partly by ESSER, and some of them are covered also by our title funds, okay? Um, which we won't be losing. We know we're gonna be losing ESSER. So as we look at your local budgets, there's times where we're gonna be looking to budget in intervention, even though we may have it covered by ESSER funding at the moment, so that we don't lose it. Um, when ESSER funds leave. And so that's something I've talked to many of you about at the local budget around the idea that we need to keep those positions as placeholders um, and keep them in the local budgets, even though we may have federal revenue right now that we're able to use um, to support those positions, but we need to ensure that we don't lose them. I also believe that as we strengthen our system, we should need less intervention. Uh, in some of our districts, we have a lot of interventionists that we should be able to start to see decrease in regards to ac academic intervention. That doesn't mean we're, we're losing staff, it just means their assignments may change. And so the monies that we already have budgeted for that intervention, we'll be able to utilize that to ensure that mass covered as well, right? So we shouldn't need as much reading intervention as our reading improves. Um, we should be able to take some of that funding and transfer it to ensure that we have reading and math where prior to this year, it was all focused on reading. We didn't have any math intervention. Um, questions, thoughts? Um, I know that the 8% number may flag people. If you look, um, again, the big chunk of that really is in regards to getting some additional support around curriculum alignment. Um, and that's not to say, by the way, that we can't use some grant funding to cover some of that position. I don't want you to think that that would all be funded locally, but I think it's important for you to see that difference. Um, and then again, we'll continue to work on the special ed budget as well. But I would, I tell, I will tell you that I have no reason to believe that we can't keep it in a reasonable range, but deliver hopefully even better programming. Um, and we'll see how that partnership works out potentially with CBSU. Mm -hmm. Megan has a question. And you'll see the full budget in November, where the local budgets we do in December, but you'll see all the budget lines next month because uh, we're going to be looking to get comment again so that if we have to have two meetings in December, we will. Okay. Um, but that we'll look to try to have this wrapped up in December. All right. Any thoughts? Comments, questions, thoughts? All right. Did I miss anything? No, you did a fantastic job. All right. Um, board retreat, review, discuss the suggested dates and times. What was the suggested date, Jamie? Well, I mean, I suggested some Saturdays just because we don't have other board meetings or commitments. Uh, it seems like maybe Saturdays are not great for folks. So um, I guess I'm open to suggestions. It seems like Sarah might have a great one. No, I don't. I just have a question, a clarifying one. How much, What are we talking about a whole day meeting or are we talking more, more you know three a half what kind what are we talking about i suggested nine to twelve on a saturday and i suggested that only because we had done it in rochester stockbridge and i found it to be a really positive meeting i'm looking at bill because he's next to me we did that sarah and then we had lunch yeah um and you know we wrapped up by 12 45 and i felt like we all came in with fresh head at least a fresh mind at least i did right like I came, I knew that's the only thing on my mind. I didn't have a bunch of things that had hit my plate already prior in the day. And it just, it felt pretty conducive to an actual retreat. Um, so that's why I suggested the Saturdays, but I get that we're also coming up to a busy time of year for folks too, with holidays and things. 
So. And hunting. So which Saturday know. did you get? I really didn't get good feedback on any of the Saturdays. I mean, only eight people have filled it out thus far. So that's not even a, a quorum. But I, the best Saturday I got was four, and that was for a week from this Saturday. And then I got four people who said Saturdays don't work. Um, so do we have a commitment from the board to do this? Well, I, I would wonder, and I know that everyone is sick of Zoom, but my conflict is a childcare one on weekends. Um, so either we could have it at campus and people with kids, like someone wants to bring their kid to play with my kids, she'll play with anyone on a playground for three hours. Um, <laughs> Or, uh, you know, I'm happy to, I guess, to take it by, you know, I can sit on Zoom for three hours. I've done it many times. I don't think the retreat really works on Zoom. I, think. I don't think so. But, uh, you know, I think if we want participation, we might have to consider that as an option, especially if we try and do it on weekends, um, unless we move a little bit further out into uh, the springtime. I think that we're entering a time of year, I mean, not only with added meetings for budget, but also Thanksgiving, Hanukkah, Christmas, that. So it makes it, you know, it make, that's, that makes it difficult, I think. Um, but I also, I mean, I believe that we need to be in, it will be better if we're together. Um, and I think that the sharing of a meal is a really important part of it too. So I like the nine to, you know, twelve forty-five or whatever, just because I think that's an important part of of it. But cool. Um, what if we we thought about like doing something in February? Like that's kind of everybody's downtime. You're sick of the winter. You're sick of being inside. Perhaps we would be enjoy going out and having lunch with each other at that point in time. Um, we've all gone through our budget season and done all that, and uh, new mind, minds looking toward the following year. I mean, so, cut your suggestion that February would be great at Tampa Bay, maybe. Uh, <laughs> or Key West. Yeah, Dominican yeah. Republic. Yeah. Dominican Republic is nice. Yeah. <laughs> we'll take Jamie's jet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I think that's great. So I don't think there's any magical time. I think it's impossible given the fact that by definition, people on boards are busy people. Yeah. This isn't the only commitment. This is not the only thing that people do uh, to take care of their community um, and, and their jobs and responsibilities. And so uh, I do want to report the retreat we had in Rochester and Stockbridge. It was well attended. Part of it was getting to know each other. Um, about half our board were new, including myself. So. Uh, and being there in person made a difference. Um, and it wasn't like we we're making a, a ton of decisions. That's not the first, it was kind of get together, build the team as, as a sense of a, a group and discuss some interesting things. And uh, I agree, uh, sharing food is, is a wonderful way to do it. So I don't think we have to have 100% participation. I would really encourage to throw that the net out again and see what other people haven't responded, uh, whether uh, we can get response um, and then we can make a make a decision. Uh, so you want to do that, Jamie? Try yeah. throwing it out again, see if we February. can get everything soon. And, um, or if you want to try getting something soon, Bill, are you suggesting? Or I'm not suggesting, I don't way. think it's a magical time and this is a busy time. I do think there's something important about the coming together um, and and uh, so February is not too late to me. What about if we throw a date out and sort of, I mean, it's so what I'm thinking of is February 5th. It's a Saturday. Put it out now. That gives people three months to, to, to work around their schedules and plan it, you know, put it in. Um, sometimes it's easier to put a date out than to put a lot of dates out and try to get people to just, you know, to say, yeah, I can do this one, but not that, you know, so. And it gives us an opportunity to go back to our local boards and talk about it. You know what I mean? Like go back and, and remind people and maybe, yeah. you know what I mean? Like you can take, I can take it the FO board and say, hey, this is the day we're planning the full board retreat. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, it's three, three, four months out. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm going to be as ready that, you know, I can plan uh -huh. around it. Yeah, I, I agree. And, you know, if I, if I know that there's something coming up in February, then I can line up some child care help if I need it. I also think if we push off till February, uh, you know, we are in the middle of a pretty serious COVID surge in our state right now. If we push off till February, more of us will have had the opportunity to get boosters and hopefully those of us with children will be able to get them vaccinated. So I think that pushing it forward a few months uh, to me makes a little bit more sense from a COVID consciousness point of view. Sounds like we got February 5th. February 5th is our date. Look at us in our teamwork. <laughs> um, Ray's going to send you all an invite here in the next 10 minutes. <laughs> um, action. I think we we're just going to table that until next month. It'll okay. look the same. Uh, resignations, new hires. Mm -hmm. Any other business tonight, anybody? No. Uh, next meeting date is Monday, November 22nd. Where? Uh, let's see. So we got our next meeting date is actually going to be, remember, November 8th at Sharon. We just put a special on. That's right. Is that a policy? A policy. Yeah. So that one will be back to Bethel. We agreed we would go down and then back up. So I want to reiterate that we could be at the SU office right now. Um, so I'm not sure we're going to schools, but the. That's what it was decided when you guys set the meeting locations, but. We're mostly virtual, so it kind of made makes sense to have it at the SU office, but we can discuss that next month. If it, mm -hmm. if it turns out it's not like this, I think we should go back to the Listen, central office. I think I'm, my staff and I are fine with having to be at the SU office. Yeah. And I drove there tonight because I got to have it. Then realized, oh crap, we changed it. <laughs> Um, uh, so the 22nd is Thanksgiving week for, uh, it's a full, is that a full board? It's a full board meeting. Do we want to try to have a meeting Thanksgiving week or should we try to, that's the Monday of Thanksgiving. So that, I mean, I think we could pull that off. Americans are not allowed to give thanks until Wednesday of that week, I thought. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> This is what I learned in history class. <laughs> I missed it. I'm sure it was funny. Americans are allowed to give thank you. All right. On that note, I think I will let the panel voting motion to adjourn. Don't move. Don't move. All right. Thank you, everybody. So move. We're adjourned. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you.